because the minute that you give them access to it, you also need to change the character of the assets themselves. I think mm -hmm. that's a really interesting question. Mm. It's a difficult question. <laughs> Jennifer, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, pleased to be here. Now, you're a financial economist and a professor at the University of North Carolina, is that That's right? right. University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. There are many universities of North Carolina, and oh. we're, we're the one at Chapel Hill. Right. Mm -hmm. Important to note that. Thank you very much. Um, now, Jennifer, I wanted to start rather broadly, uh, if you don't mind. Um, here in 2022, these are, these are turbulent and difficult markets to navigate. So I wonder, as you look at, um, uh, at markets across the board, what do you think are the biggest drivers right now? Volatility, and volatility um, f coming from uh, many different sources. Um, I'll, I'll use a North Carolina anecdote for this, mm. um, and I'll, I'll get the details wrong because I don't remember the exact details, but there was a mayor in the eastern part of North Carolina who mentioned at one time that they were paying for cleanup from an ice storm. They were still uh, cleaning up from flooding from a hurricane, and they'd just been hit by a tornado. And so it had been a bad year for them. And I think if you look at the markets um, right now, um, we are hopefully recovering from a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing um, the first in the US inflation in 50 years. Mm -hmm. And we're also seeing some geopolitical tensions that I don't think anybody anticipated um, would, have, would have said anything like that would happen. And so if you look at, if you compare 2019 to 2022, um, the, th the topics that most people are talking about were not topics that were on anybody's horizon. All of them um, are creating, I think, a lot of uncertainty in the markets, and all of them are interacting with one another in really unpredictable ways. Mm -hmm. And so some opinions that you might have about um, how to deal with inflation probably are going to be impacted by the things that are going on in Europe and likely have something to do with how we're um, coming out of the pandemic. So it's just a ball of uncertainty right now. So um, to sort of maneuver that slightly to a discussion about central banks and their ability to control inflation, mm -hmm. it seems like general opinion is that, you know, this is a supply driven inflation move and that typically central banks can affect demand more than they can supply. So what's your thoughts about central banks particularly the Fed, being able to bring inflation under control? I think that they have a lot of tools to do it, but I also think that they're going to have to make some pretty unusual moves um, to, to, take, to take account of the actions they've taken in the past. So I'm not a macroeconomist, um, but I think it'll be interesting um, as a non-macroeconomist to see how they deal with quantitative tightening, because I, I don't think that they've really done that type of, of that scale of transaction before ever. Mm. And so if you think about um, uh, we're in a very unusual inflationary environment, um, uh, think about this as, as I've heard recently, someone saying, you know, we've got a sample in our lifetimes of one. Um, but in terms of uh, the quantitative tightening that they're going to start engaging in uh, soon and then double down on in September, we have a sample size of zero. And, and perhaps that um, has that goes really smoothly, but perhaps it doesn't. And so I think that, that that's related to the uncertainty that I was mm -hmm. talking about earlier. You say you're not so much of a macroeconomist, but if you were to kind of look out and see how you think the Fed is going to behave, do you see we're in a, you know, a sustained uh, rate tightening cycle, or, or how do you see it play out for the next 18 months? I, I, th I don't see inflation. Um, coming down substantially in the next year. Um, I mean, again, I'm not a macroeconomist, but I think if you look at where energy prices are right now and you think about the things that are happening in Europe and you think about how long the cycle would be for significant supply mm -hmm. to affect the increases in prices that we've seen, um, I don't think that's going to be a very short-term phenomenon. Um, I think if you look at um, food prices, and I'm going to stick with food and energy for the moment because I think that's where a lot of people's yeah. attention is right now. I think un until we get a sense about how the European events are going to affect food exports from a really significant part of the country, I don't see that really coming down quickly. I think there are knock-on effects that I don't, certainly I don't understand in terms of what's going to happen to some of the, the markets that are important for food production, like fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So I, I think as those things feed into um, agricultural prices down the road, 
I think there's some pretty significant concerns that I've read about where food prices are going to go. And those are two very significant components mm. of what people care about and what the, what the indexes are going to do. And then there's, there's housing, and I just don't see that. It may not go up anymore, but I don't see that coming down over the next 12 months. I don't think that's how rents work. So I, I don't see it coming down. So you mean house pricing or rents or both? I mean both. I mean, yeah. I think about it. And that's I mean, simply because there just isn't enough housing for people. Yeah, I think that rental prices, uh, the rent, rents, monthly rents aren't going to come down. And I think that certainly the housing market will slow down. Maneuvering slightly back towards financial markets, mm -hmm. um, this year has been particularly difficult for the performance of the 60-40 classic portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you think um, this is just a dip in performance for that model uh, or whether we're going to need to rethink that, that classic structure and, and perhaps start looking more towards alternative investments? Well, I think alternative investments, and, and I use a very broad definition of alternative okay. investments, but if, if I think of it as private capital markets and hedge funds and natural resources Venture and real estate, mm -hmm. that is such a large um, proportion of not, I'm not going to use the word investable, but let, let's talk about assets out there, mm -hmm. that I think that Ignoring that entirely um, in a 60-40 portfolio just isn't very sensible. And I also think that the, the makeup of the 60-40 portfolio, that heuristic, um, has changed significantly um, anyway in the last 10 years when you think about target date funds, for mm -hmm. example. Right. I mean, you have to be pretty far down the glide path of a target date fund before you're anything like a 60-40 portfolio. So I think to some extent it had already uh, not died, but it had already gotten unhealthy, I'll mm -hmm. say. And I also think that there's so much more information out there about how changes in the economic conditions, economic circumstances, where we are in the business cycle, might um, reasonably affect someone's uh, asset allocation. That, that in aggregate, even if it's still 60-40, I, I think, or you know, across time it may still be 60-40, but I think that there's there's more acknowledgement that maybe that needs to change as we go through the business cycle. So think about it as a maybe an unconditional 60-40, yeah. but maybe be at different points around that as you go through a business cycle. When you talk to your students today mm -hmm. and um, those who want to go into the world of finance, mm -hmm. do you um, believe that the world of finance they're going into in terms of evaluating companies or, or commodities is, is going gonna, is gonna to be changing? Or what's... Um, what do you sort of teach them today that, that may be different from the past five to ten years? In, in my material, the basic framework would be the same, which is I, I still think about the valuation as being a discounted cash flow analysis. Okay. I think there are so many new uh, information sources, so many different data sources that you can go to um, when you think about trying to come up with good forecasts of cash flows. Uh, trying to try to think about where discount rates might go, mm -hmm. um, historical data that we have access to now that we might not have had access to. Um, when you think about machine learning approaches to, to some forecasting methods for, for cash flows, I think that those inputs uh, may be higher quality, but the framework in which you're going to glue those inputs, I, th I still think about as being um, the mm -hmm. same. And when you, when you sort of uh, quiz or talk to your students about what area of finance they want to go into, mm -hmm. do you see a shift in people still wanting to go into portfolio management roles or do you see more people wanting to do private equity market type roles or investment banking type roles? I think that our students, at least at North Carolina, um, have shifted a little bit more into wanting to do more entrepreneurial activities. And mm -hmm. so, so they, they think about um, newer companies, startup companies, um, creating their own companies, which is um, a, sh a shift, I think, so away from some, something like traditional investment banking yeah. and more toward um, creating their own career, or curating yeah. their own career. If I, you I, like. was, I was wondering how much uh, in the world of digital assets uh, you, you teach your students and how much mm -hmm. uh, demand there is for them to go into that world. I teach derivatives, and I have not spent a lot of time um, on digital assets in my class, although it has crept in. I mean, a good example would be, you know, we talk a little bit about the futures contract on Bitcoin because it's fun to right, it's fun yeah, to sure. talk about. So, so in my class, it doesn't ha have a huge place, but um, in our students, in all of our programs, there's a huge demand for for fintech, and that's fintech defined again very broadly. So you can think about it as 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 cryptos. You can also think about it as 
as understanding just how, I mean, in, in what my lifetime might have been, okay, everyone now has a debit card. Um, the, the newest uh, uh, types or examples of, of that kind of, uh, mm -hmm. like, like peer to peer lending or, right, yeah. or those types of things. And I think they're, they're interested in, in how that landscape has changed and how they might be, uh, might, how their career might be a part of it. Mm -hmm. How do you look out into the world of, uh, of, of regulation? Um, is regu do you see regulation changing to, to a large degree, or do you kind of feel like the sort of status quo of finance will remain how it is? No, I, I, think, I think that regulation is going to change. I mean, to the, I've done some work in mar market microstructure, um, and there over the last 20 years, two papers I did 20 years ago, um, I did another two in the last five years, and the entire uh, market microstructure, that landscape has changed entirely. Everything that I thought a little I knew. Bit what do you mean by microstructure? So, so I think about market microstructure as being about exchanges. So, so mm. trading, uh, the buying and selling of, of publicly traded securities. Um, and, and I typically focus on the equity market and doing papers um, in that topic in 2000, 2001, 2002, um, and then doing another set of papers in 2015, 2017, 2020, everything that I thought I knew about market microstructure in 2000 was just dead and gone by mm -hmm. the time I, I, you came back around it. Mm -hmm. And mo some of it, it was technology, <clears throat> um, and a lot of it was regulation. And so when you think about what the, at least in the U.S., what the, what the SEC um, wanted to do with markets is to cr create a lot of competition. And they got a lot of competition amongst markets, and that created some fragmentation that they then had to deal with, um, sort of the unintended consequences of their, of their search for competition. But when you think about, I, I used to talk about specialists. We don't have specialists anymore. Um, I, we, we didn't talk about electronic trading. Mm. I wondered what five-minute returns even meant. And then in the last paper we did, we were looking at trades over a 100 millisecond horizon. So, so very, very different um, landscape. And, and, and that, a lot of that was due to regulation. The regulations that the SEC put in place um, in 2005 to 2007 with Reg NMS, um, their alternative trading strategy regulations, mm -hmm. a lot of the things that, they, that they've done since then have all created a very, very different market microstructure and, and landscape. To what extent have, have quants made a big difference to the way equities trade? Um, and is, is that an area which you, which you look at? So I've only looked at it to the extent that it has to do with some of the market microstructure work um, that, that, I've, that I've done, because a lot of the, the quants that, that I first uh, spoke with in the early aughts um, took the information that they had and tried to trade on it really rapidly. They were the beginning of mm -hmm. the high frequency traders. And I think a lot of what they had to do um, dealt with um, a more rapid assimilation of information, and then following that, they were actually looking at the information in the book, in mm. the trading book. And so to the extent that the trading book changes on a millisecond by millisecond basis, then of course they're going to start to think about inf that as being an information flow in itself. Mm. And then when you think about the explosion of information out there, uh, you know, how many cars are parked in this particular parking lot, or you know, what's the, what are key card swipes in New York right now, yeah. and what does that tell us about how quickly people are going back to work, mm. and that, that flood of data and the machine learning techniques that people have developed to try to deal with it, um, all of that's quantitative, so I think that that's, that's going to be an increasing part of how right. people choose to trade. How about um, this idea of the democratization of finance and mm -hmm. the retail investor having much more of a voice? Is that something that you've, um, uh, is that something that you've explored and, and, and researched? The ability of retail traders to get um, access to alternative investments is something of interest to me. I've not done any specific research on it. Mm -hmm. I think that it one of the interesting questions that, that I think about, and again, it's related to a little bit my work in market microstructure because that is that has to do with liquidity. One of the biggest differences between alternative investments and publicly traded investments is how liquid they are. Right. And so one of the ways that, one of the interesting questions that I think comes up here is, are alternative investments the way they are because they have they are different assets and they are traded by a different type of investor an investor with a longer horizon or an investor who has fewer capital constraints or an investor who is more sophisticated has better access to lawyers and then publicly traded investments are the way they are because they're traded by another type of investor someone who doesn't have a lot of time doesn't have a lawyer standing on uh, standing at their right elbow, 
um, may have capital constraints and, and needs liquidity. And so to the extent that you give retail traders who think about assets in this particular way, that I mm -hmm. need liquidity and I don't have a lot of sophistication, to give them access to that set of assets in a responsible way, do you need to think about changing that set of assets that, that changes the kind of assets that they are? So mm -hmm. it doesn't allow them to make whatever diversification and performance benefits that they have, because the minute that you give them access to it, you also need to change the character of the assets themselves. I think mm -hmm. that's a really interesting question. Mm. It's a difficult question. How about the topic of ESG? Is that something that um, you know you try and teach your students to say this mm -hmm. is going to be a you know very significant factor when it comes to the evaluation of companies and corporates? Well, I think that there's a lively. Uh, portfolio Debate. of research on mm. whether that's true or not. Um, we are starting uh, with uh, some some of my co-authors, we are starting to think about uh, doing some work on, on ESG and more the E part of ESG right. than anything else. Um, data there are hard, hard to come by. So mm. one of the questions that we would like to try to answer is, to the extent that a firm's claimants change, so think about the equity holders in a firm as, as being in a way that we can measure um, more uh, climate conscious. And you can think about trying to get a measure of that both on the equity side and the debt side. Neither of those <coughs> measures are easy to come by. But we thought it would be an interesting question to ask to the extent that the stakeholders or the claimants um, in the firm um, are raise their hand in some way and say, you know, we're green. We, we care more about E than your average investor. Does that have? Does that make a difference to the the emissions of the firm? Does it does it make a difference through time, or does it make a difference across sector, mm. depending on what the the claimants in the firm are as to what their actual climate outcomes are? Mm -hmm. And and it is a challenge right now. And it, one of the things I was talking uh, to people about in, in the industry are where can we get good data, mm -hmm. um, both on the who are the claimants of the firm and good data on what are, the, um, what are the environmental outcomes, the emissions, for example, of the firm. And, and there are data sets available for those, but I think the quality on those are still yeah. an open question. Okay, well, mm -hmm. the key is in the data. Um, always for, always, for, always for in academics. The data. <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, lastly ask, um, what sort of trends in equity markets do you think people should be paying attention to and maybe aren't paying enough attention to right now? In equity markets, one of the things that, that I'm interested in is ETFs. I, I uh -huh. think that, and some of this is on the academic side, I think that there has been a huge sea change in how um, ETFs uh, are making trading activities um, maybe more interesting for investors. Um, you think about ETFs as being passive vehicles, yeah. but, but in many cases, the ETFs right now are more actively managed portfolios than anything else. And, and yet that is an under-researched area. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is an, it's a growing rapidly area of research in academics, but even the extent to which it's growing is still more on the passive ETF side. Right. And, and I think it's the active ETFs that, that are growing more rapidly and I think very under-researched in academics. And, and so that's, that's one thing that I would like to take a look at. So, so could you just explain, what do you mean uh, exactly about the difference between passive and active ETFs? So, so when I think about an ETF or talk to, an e uh, talk to my students about an ETF, what I have in mind probably, and what they have in mind uh, may be um, something that mimics the S&P 500, like mm -hmm. the spider, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that would be something that, that mimics, right, a, a mutual fund that's already out there. Everyone knows, everyone nods and says, I know, I know what that is. But there are a lot of ETFs that are being developed that are really actively managed funds that are now traded as an ETF. Uh -huh. and, and those- As in the constitution of the ETF is dynamically changing over time. And, and it doesn't some, just follow one- track. And sometimes we're not sure how it's changing over time. And so to the extent that those become popular investment vehicles, I would be interested in knowing mm. how that changes the, the, the investment opportunity set of individual investors. And, and maybe it doesn't change it at all, but I think we know so little about them right now, and mm. yet they're growing really rapidly, that in the middle of this under-researched ETF topic, this is an exceptionally under-researched area um, in academics. And, and again, data are gonna be tough to come by. That's part of the reason why it's under-researched, but yeah. it'll be interesting to see if we can get there. Okay, well, something to keep an eye out for, but um, in the yeah. meantime, Jennifer, thank you so much for the time. I really well, enjoyed our chat. I did too, thank you.